Good evening. Health authorities have... These vehicles may or may not have mechanical... It will be a trial within a trial. Louise Nimer at the Ontario... The city does have a bylaw that requires... April 27th, 1984. This is Toronto. The price of power. Mulroney and manpower. And hot town summer in the city. City Pulse with Gord Martineau, Deanie Petty, Jim McKinney, and the City Pulse News Team bring you Toronto's News. Good evening. Taxpayers are going to have to foot the bill for shutting down the Douglas Point nuclear station, a staggering $100 million. Our business specialist Peter Silverman says if Ontario Hydro makes any more mistakes, our hydro bills will go through the roof. By the end of the century, Ontario will spend between 17 and 18 billion dollars at current dollar values on building nuclear power stations. That's a lot of money and it's not the only cost. Existing nuclear stations like Pickering 1 and 2 are breaking down long before anticipated. And there's no guarantee that Pickering 3 and 4 won't have similar problems costing another billion dollars to repair. Who's going to pay? The consumer starting next year. Hydro wants to raise rates by a little more than 9% next year, so uh, pretty much everybody can figure it out from their bill. But if you're paying $40 a month now, then you're talking about uh, adding almost $4 a month to it. All this has meant that Ontario Hydro's promise of keeping the rate increases below the rate of inflation won't be kept for the next few years. But says Hydro's vice president of operations, it won't last forever. What you have is that the nuclear plants are much more capital intensive. They take much more front-end money. The payback comes that over, over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, they will be much more economic to operate. Ontario Hydro has borrowed billions of dollars to pay for the new plants, and it's all guaranteed by the province of Ontario. That's you and me as taxpayers. And each year, it pays out a billion dollars of interest to American lenders and another $700 billion to other creditors. I'm Peter Silverman for City Pulse. You might think Ontario Hydro would make better use of its money if the government was not involved. But the People News cameraman Max Trotter met today at King & Victoria feel that wouldn't make much difference. I think they'd have uh, more problems as a privately run company. Uh, I think their job is so immense that they need the power of a provincial agency to cope with the uh, enormity of the uh, hydroelectric situation in the province. Management would have to answer to uh, the owners of a company of that, that size, and uh, if they didn't give the right answers and didn't produce better than what Ontario Hydro, uh, they wouldn't be managers. I think that they would have the same problems. At this point, uh, the, the post office has changed over to Crown Corporation. They still have as many problems as when they were privately owned, so I don't see where it would change for Hydro. Ontario Treasurer Larry Grossman told the legislature today he will bring down his first budget on May 15th. He says although health costs are increasing at a rate of $1 billion a year, he does not think Ontario residents would refuse to pay more to maintain the quality of the health care system. In Grossman's budget, look for programs aimed at helping unemployed youth and some attempt to battle the deficit, which now absorbs 22 cents out of every dollar spent by the province. I think it's, uh, it will be a sensitive budget addressing our uh, most urgent priorities, which are to invest in our economy, particularly in our young people. And I'm trying to do that in a responsible way so that we don't mortgage our future as we do that. You can't invest in your future if at the same time you're mortgaging your future by running huge deficits. Conservative leader Brian Mulroney talked about youth unemployment at a Scarborough High School today. But according to political specialist Colin Bond, the audience was not impressed. Obviously vying for a corner of the spotlight now occupied by Liberal leadership candidates, Federal Conservative leader Brian Mulroney swung through Toronto on a mini tour today. But before he got down to the business at hand, I asked Mulroney if he was disappointed that Bryce Mackesy had decided not to contest the Liberal leadership. Well, Bryce, is, uh, Bryce would have been head and shoulders over the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> Mulroney told the students at Norman Bethune Collegiate in Agent Court that youth unemployment would be a number one priority of the Conservative government, adding that the creation of wealth was the way to ensure more jobs. That has been the Thatcher formula in Britain. Wealth has indeed been created there. Those already with jobs are certainly more secure, but unemployment is as high as ever. If it hasn't worked in Britain, why will it work here? 
Oh, I think that it's pretty clear that it's going to work here because there's going to be a new degree of confidence, investor confidence around the world that's going to attract those, that money we need for the two million jobs. Well, quick to outline the dimensions of youth unemployment, Mulroney had no answers to the students. He didn't really answer the question. He just told us about the situation right now and he didn't really answer much, many questions. He sort of beat around the bush and didn't really tell us any specific solutions. Even so, on the way out, not the hysteria a Pierre Trudeau is apt to generate, but how about a touch of Mulroney mania? Later, Brian and Mila visited the Armenian Community Centre at 401 in Victoria Park, where on Sunday a memorial will be unveiled to commemorate the Armenian Holocaust of 1915. Although the Tory leader tried hard, it was the children from the Armenian schools who stole the show. Colin Vaughan with the Tory leader at City Pulse. In the meantime, the Turks have never acknowledged what the Armenians call the first genocide of the 20th century, the slaughter of one and a half million Armenians during the First World War. While Colin was at the Armenian Center, he asked Mulroney if his visit means the Tories are taking sides. Does this visit mean that your party is taking the Armenian side in the dispute with Turkey? No, we're just uh, coming by to um, salute uh, a cultural community in Canada that's uh, contributed a great deal to enriching our heritage, and uh, we're delighted to be here. No political significance? No, the only significance of it is the fact that we're uh, honored by the invitation and delighted to be here, and particularly with children on such a sunny day. It's new hope, and uh, that's what the future is all about. Do you think the Armenians have a just cause? Oh, I think that that's been discussed in the, in the House, but we're not uh, here on any political mission at all today. We're... Our cameras are with Mulroney tonight at a conservative celebration of Toronto's Sesqui Centennial. A little later tonight on Close Up, Colin Vaughan will check out the two liberal leadership frontrunners, John Turner and Jean Chrétien. The OPP is investigating the Hamilton Wentworth Police Department. It all concerns murder charges against an 18-year-old man. Lauren Honickman tells us tonight the charges were dropped this week, but the former suspect claims the police beat him to get a confession. Maybe they were in a miserable mood. Maybe they weren't in a miserable mood. I just have no idea why they'd pick up, a, pick up an innocent person and put him in jail for four months for something he didn't do. 17-year-old William Baker was charged with the stabbing murder of Hamilton resident Lewis Dunphy back on January 2nd. He spent four months in custody, and on Tuesday, the charge was dropped. Baker said he originally confessed to the murder after police assaulted him. Well, they smacked me around to make me sign the second confession that they want to hear. I think the way they went about the investigation stinks. I think, uh, I think they revealed their lower selves. I think maybe uh, some of them people have been on the job too long, maybe, I don't know. The Hamilton Wentworth Police Department do not want to talk about the case. However, late yesterday, the chief of police there released a short statement. The statement reads, as, as a result of certain allegations and inconsistencies in the investigation and the public concerns relating to this matter and following consultations with Mr. D. Paquette, Crown Attorney, I've requested the Commissioner of the Ontario Provincial Police to conduct a thorough independent investigation. At Queen's Park today, Ontario Solicitor General George Taylor was asked for a public inquiry as well. Would be a little premature to embark on a public inquiry at this particular time and that uh, we will wait uh, until such time as I have a, a more complete picture. This whole ordeal apparently has cost the Baker family a great deal in legal costs, and Taylor was asked today whether or not the government would compensate them. His response, the same as the public inquiry question, it's too early to tell, we'll have to wait and see what the investigation shows. Lauren Honickman, City Pulse. Some 150 lawsuits worth hundreds of millions of dollars are still outstanding from the Mississauga train derailment. But they should be cleared up in just a couple of weeks. Mr. Justice Robert Montgomery of the Supreme Court of Ontario has set aside the last week of May and the first week of June to hear pre-trial motions. He told us today, quote, I have a strong expectation that by the end of June we will see some modern miracles in this case. Just before the start of one of Metro's largest drug trials, two Toronto women and a man from Montreal have pleaded guilty to conspiracy to traffic in narcotics. Michelle Segal, Gabrielle Stratton, and David Stone confessed today to being part of a multi-million dollar operation 
supplying drugs into Canada from a farm in Maine. On Monday, 14 other people allegedly involved in the same ring will appear in Ontario Supreme Court. The trial is expected to last for the rest of this year. When the arrests were made, police seized 1,000 pounds of hashish oil and 300 pounds of marijuana. In North York, 34 unionized workers laid off by the Villa Colombo nursing home are fighting for their jobs. Carolyn Joe tells us tonight they've been replaced with contract workers. That's not sitting well with the local union leaders. They are nothing more than anti-union, union-busting, corporate do-gooders. And it's about time the people in Toronto knew what they were doing. To retaliate against the Italian workers' layoffs, the Labour Council is launching a campaign to embarrass the Villa's Board of Governors and paint them as uncaring union breakers. We intend to bring that message to every one of our people in the City of Toronto and to show who the people are on the Board of Governors and to expose them for what they are. The villa houses 188 residents, most of them Italian. It's a government-funded operation, but the board couldn't tell us just how much money it gets. The workers were laid off as of yesterday, and their maintenance, laundry, and dietary jobs were contracted out. The villa says continuous deficits made the layoffs necessary, and contracting out will save $190,000 a year. How do you react to accusations that you are union busters? I don't think, um, I think that's wrong, that's a terminology. How could we be busting union when we still have union in here? In order to bust a union, that has to be busted by their own employees. The workers say the layoffs are particularly tragic because it means the severing of close relationships with the residents. To me, it was like my own uh, family. They had some relationship when they were cleaning the room, they were cleaning the room, um, but they didn't have a close relationship. Although organized labor is launching a campaign to discredit the Villa Colombo, the Board of Governors here says it won't be hurt by it. On the contrary, it says it's getting tremendous support from the community. Terrell and Joe at the Villa Colombo for City Pulse. Another victory tonight for the union organizing Eaton Stores. The retail, wholesale and department store union can sign up the 415 Eaton's employees at the Scarborough Town Center. Three Eaton Stores have been unionized already and the one at the Young Eglinton Center is next on the list. In Guelph today, the Canadian Farm Survival Association occupied the farm credit union offices for the last day. Their four-day occupation was to protest high interest rates. They claim that unless the rates are brought down, a lot of farmers are going to be put out of business. Experts claim the rich black soil of the Holland Marsh is eroding away, and that could mean higher prices for vegetables. But tonight, our Jojo Chindo gets the inside word from a researcher who works at the marsh he says we have nothing to worry about. The level of the black muck has been dropping steadily since 1928 when dikes were put around the marsh to keep it from flooding. The muck is made up of decomposed plant matter that's built up over thousands of years. Its uh, water holding capacity is tremendous. It will hold oh, up to 10 times its own weight in water. And that's really basically the secret of uh, this muck farming, we call it. Since 1945, the Ministry of Agriculture and Food has been studying how the topsoil is decreasing. According to the research, it has dropped two and a half feet in less than 40 years. So we've been able to slow down that subsidence or the shrinkage of the soil, the oxidation of the organic matter, by manipulating the water table in the soil. Gradually, we'll uh, get rid of, you know, we'll be rid of it all, uh, and we'll be back to a mineral soil. And there'll still be an abundance of vegetable crops because you can grow these same crops that we grow here, onions, carrots, uh, celery, and so on, on mineral soil just as well as on these organic soils. So. What you're saying is that even if we lose the soil, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter as far as uh, supply to the, uh, to the markets in Toronto is concerned. There will always be plenty of vegetables in Ontario. The farmers here on the Holland Marsh are getting ready to plant some seeds. With good favorable weather, there should be lots of carrots, celery, head lettuce and onions on the market within six weeks. And we should pay a lot less for them than the imported vegetables we've been buying over the winter months. I'm Jojo Chinto for City Pauls. Here's an early look now at the Friday night traffic scene as we go live to Lauren Honick on it. Well, Gord, first of all, 11 division officers are presently at 55 Triller Avenue. The young child has just fallen off an 8th floor balcony there. Details are still very sketchy, but we do know the little boy has been taken by ambulance to St. Joseph's Hospital. His condition is unknown. Police are still investigating. 
And Metro Fire Department had a very busy day today. At 3 o'clock this afternoon, they battled a fire at 1025 Craven Road. The cause of this fire, a short circuit in the heater of the waterbed. There were no injuries. Total damage, about $10,000. And at 10.30 this morning, they were on the scene at 207 Palmerston. They made short work of a fire here. The cause of this one is still under investigation. Total damage, $4,000. And it's been a beautiful day outside today. To find out more, let's go to our live eye down by the lake where weatherman Brian Hill has been sunning himself. I'll tell you, technically, yes, the sun is shining, but it's cold down here. You know, it's uh, only 11 degrees at Harbor Front. Meanwhile, up at the airport, it's 19. We're talking about a 7, 8 degree temperature range between being down by the water and being inland, so to speak. And that's the way it's going to be this weekend. The bywords for weather this weekend are don't panic. Yes, there's some severe weather headed into our area, but there's going to be some nice times, too. I'll have you all filled in later in the City Weather Watch for right now. Sports and Debbie. Well, I've got Stanley Cup playoff action from last night in Edmonton and Montreal. High school baseball and horse racing. J.D. Thanks, Debbie. Actor Mel Gibson is scheduled to appear, to appear in a Toronto courtroom after having a minor car accident in the city. We'll have details on that, plus part five of Jeannie Becker's look at the National Ballet of Canada and a look at a real Canadian theatrical success story. All that later on Entertainment. Gork. Thank you, J.D. Next on City Pulse at 6, the end of the Libyan siege in London. Did Margaret Thatcher handle the Libyan siege correctly? I think she did a very good job on it. Yes, I think she had very limited choices, and uh, I thought she handled it quite well. Well, she seems to have handled the Falklands crisis correctly, but people in England don't seem to be too happy with the way she's handled the Libyan siege. I hope she does better on the next siege. I suppose she did uh, <laughs> under the circumstances when you're dealing with uh, a man who knows uh, no bounds of uh, current diplomacy like uh, Omar Gaddafi. I suppose she handled the best way she could, although it doesn't compensate it at all for the death of the police officer in London. The end of the siege at the Libyan embassy in London. A quiet, peaceful affair in sharp contrast to the way it began more than a week ago. An update now from Don Porter. At mid-morning, the Libyans began to emerge from the embassy. Police kept a close watch, on guard against trouble. There was none. Earlier, 18 bulky bags removed from the embassy were loaded on a plane bound for Libya. The bags cannot be searched. They are under diplomatic seal. But the police are certain one contains the weapon fired from an embassy window 11 days ago. That burst of gunfire wounded 10 anti gaddafi demonstrators and killed policewoman Yvonne Fletcher. Even as the Libyans were whisked out of central London, bound for the airport, Constable Fletcher's family and fellow officers mourned her at funeral services held at Salisbury Cathedral. Under the deal between Britain and Libya, none of the Libyans expelled today will face prosecution for the shooting of Yvonne Fletcher. This afternoon, police began a detailed search at St. James's Square. But the embassy itself will not be entered until Sunday, after diplomatic relations between Britain and Libya are officially severed. The siege now ended, the British government turns to the question of how to keep London from again becoming a deadly battleground for the warring factions of foreign nations. Don Porter, NBC News, London. On Bay Street this afternoon, a demonstration against the Russian presence in Afghanistan. The Islamic Unity Afghan Mujahid called for the withdrawal of Soviet troops which have been battling Afghan rebels for more than three years. And we learned from the U.S. State Department tonight, the Soviet Union has launched its biggest ever offensive in Afghanistan. Apparently thousands of Soviet airborne and ground troops, tanks and aircraft are now attacking Afghan rebel positions. We're told the rebels are retreating. They're no match for 20,000 Soviet soldiers. The Kennedy clan and close friends gathered today in Massachusetts for the funeral of David Kennedy, the 28-year-old son of the late Senator Robert Kennedy. David's body was found Wednesday in a Florida hotel room. Traces of cocaine and the painkiller Demerol were found in Kennedy's body, but the exact cause of his death has not yet been determined.
A busy day for President Reagan in China. Two sessions with Premier Zhao Ziyang and a state dinner in the Great Hall of the People. Earlier, Reagan gave a nationwide television broadcast in which he spoke of the Soviet threat, but the Chinese censors cut that part out, apparently disapproving of Reagan's harsh language about their Soviet neighbor. And while President Reagan was talking politics, his wife Nancy was visiting China's world-famous pandas. First Lady Nancy Reagan began her activities with children and pandas at the Beijing Zoo. The highlight of this event was Cheng Cheng, an eight-month-old baby giant panda conceived by artificial insemination. When Mrs. Reagan heard these elementary school children were collecting pennies for pandas, she launched a similar drive at home and brought along a check for $13,000 collected from American children to help the pandas. Later, the First Lady visited the Temple of Heaven, a 15th century ceremonial site used by emperors for fasting and prayer. She stopped for a while to talk to reporters. Although the Chinese have not shown much outward enthusiasm, their journalists seem most interested in Mrs. Reagan's impressions. They drowned out her answers to American reporters' questions with questions of their own. First of all, the people are so nice and so warm and so wonderful. And I wish that I, wish that I could stay much, much longer and see everything that I'd like to see. She answered each one and left to tour an arts and crafts shop where she bought presents for family and friends. The First Lady's aide said she shared some of the President's briefings on China and read two books and numerous articles on her own. She was described as extremely fascinated with the country and said herself she was so excited she was hardly able to sleep. Emory King, NBC News, Beijing. Close Up is next on City Pulse at 6 with Deanie Petty. Tonight, political specialist Colin Bond with the two liberal front runners. <laughs> Having seen the Liberal leadership candidates, I think Trudeau's had his day and he's about time, it's about time he left. I have my, my doubts about Turner because it doesn't give you too much of a choice between him and Mulroney. I'm glad that uh, Mr. Trudeau has decided not to stay on. I think John Turner would do a better job than he has. I would very much uh, have wished that Trudeau would have stayed on. I think he has a tremendous charisma. He has led Canada through very difficult times. I think it's time for a change. On Close Up tonight, the liberal leadership race. And our political specialist, Colin Bond, says that five of the candidates don't count and the other two can't count. It's day 58 in the liberal leadership race and with a mere 51 days to go, we're now more than halfway. And the air has cleared a little, but not much. This is a race of two front runners, with the others only important as to where their support might go when the crunch comes. Acknowledged front runner John Turner continues to stumble around the country, showing his spell away from the lists has cost him, earning him the nickname of Rusty, and raising doubts in the minds of more delegates than he'd like to admit. At latest count, some 30% of delegates chosen to date remain undecided, despite the wooing of Rusty and the other front runner, Jean Chrétien. The story of Chrétien is his apparent inability to come out ahead in his home province of Quebec. Observers there say the combination of Chrétien's all-out support for the Canadian Constitution and his rough-hewn image are working against him. It seems that after 15 years of the sophisticated and urbane Pierre Trudeau, French Canadians are not anxious to return to the bad old days of the habitant and all that that implies. After they've seen Paris, how can they ever go back to the farm? But as far as Turner is concerned, he'd better be over the top or damned close on that first ballot. Or do you remember the contest between Joe Clark and Brian Maroney? Absolutely. <laughs> Stephen Lewis doesn't see much hope for the also rans. Here he is with tonight's editorial comment. The federal liberal leadership race is now just over a month away, and it's hardly been a matter of cosmic exhilaration thus far. It has been, on the other hand, a matter of cosmic tedium. The question is why. I think it's pretty obvious the two front runners are so far ahead of the rest of the pack that none of them can ever catch up. Or to put it another way, there's no one in the liberal leadership race equivalent to John Crosby in the Tory leadership race, somebody who might sneak up the middle and win it all. The question really is, if there's a stitch of drama left, whether or not all the also-rans can combine with enough delegate support at the convention to mount a stop Turner or stop Cretchen movement, whatever the inclination is. I don't think they can. I think the also-rans are really out of it. Three of them are purely nondescript at this point. Eugene Whalen, John Monroe, and Mark McGuigan. Must be particularly mortifying for McGuigan, who has a considerably large ego. 
And then there's John Roberts and Don Johnston. They're doing a little better. But what does that mean? It means that they'll have maybe 100, 150, 200 paltry delegates at the convention. No, at this stage, it's the rising passion of Jean Chrétien versus the fading reputation of John Turner. Stay tuned. Colin, there will come a point when the, uh, the men are separated from the boys, and uh, when do you think this is going to happen? This weekend uh, will be the beginning of it. The Liberals are going to have five policy conferences across the country. The right. first one is tomorrow in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, they end up here in Toronto on June 2nd. And the thing that's been lacking in this first half of the race has been a really dealing with issues, coming up with firm proposals on issues. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of hot air, a lot of smoke, not much solid. And I think tomorrow we're going to start seeing some solidity, both in Chrétien and in Turner. You're calling Turner to take it, but it's going to be close? How I, uh, yeah, I think Turner is ahead now, and I think he's perhaps too far ahead. But uh, it seems to me that the opposition on the floor is going to be against Turner, and it's going to, the, the gap is going to narrow on the floor. It's right. going to get very close, and either one can win it, I think. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Coming up next on City Pulse, Brian Hill says that we may be in for a tricky weather weekend. And J.D. Roberts brings us ballerina Mary Jago's Last Dance at the O'Keeffe Center. Now our City Pulse news test. When will Treasurer Larry Grossman bring down his first budget? If you know the answer, call us at 870-7770. The first correct caller wins a dinner for two at Earl's Tin Palace. Such a wonderful day that we sent the weathermen outside. Brian. Yeah, where you can freeze, right? <laughs> it's cold down here at uh, the lakefront right now because the winds are very gusty. It's going to be like that uh, tomorrow as well. So keep that in mind if you're planning to do something outdoors. The big weather news this weekend is there's some, ver some very severe weather. It's going to race through the Toronto area, not be around for very long. So a majority of the uh, weekend will be rain-free. But look what's been happening in the United States. Those uh, states shown in red have had tornadoes. Oklahoma's had 10 of them, and at Red Lodge Man, Montana, 50 inches of snow. If you can imagine it, it's just like winter out there, and this is the storm that is headed toward us. We're going to take a look at a moment at the satellite uh, photograph, and you'll see the white clouds from the storm stretch through most of the midsection of the United States, and these spring extremes are being ushered along thanks to the jet stream up into our neck of the woods. You can see them there, the white clouds through the prairies as well, where in uh, the southern part of Saskatchewan they've had blowing snow, but the warm air is headed up over top of us. You can see it right there. So we'll start off toasty, and then we're going to get cool. Watch it as those warm fronts sweep through our area. You can see that those clouds are on the move and that they are coming closer and closer to us. Let me go to uh, down here at... Uh, uh, actually, I want to go to Computer Graphics. Yes, I do. Show you tomorrow morning in Toronto. Moderate breeze. That's a cold blow this evening and tomorrow morning as well. And you can see the darker clouds moving in on Saturday morning. Saturday morning will be nice. Saturday about noon hour, that's when to watch out for problems. See, tonight, we have these two waves of warm air. But Saturday morning, those dark uh, clouds that contain thunder shower activity, as a matter of fact, will be very, very close to us. And we're expecting them to hit about the noon hour. And there is an occlusion, actually, uh, that is occurring. You can see that uh, diagrammed out for you there. Saturday afternoon, those thunder showers should be moving out of our area. But then cold fronts sweep through. You can see one over Georgian Bay there. So the risk of shower activity, short off and on showers, exists through Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening. Following class? Well, on Sunday, the same risk exists. The possibility that we will be having showers, well, off and on, interspersed with sunny breaks, exists on Sunday as well. Let me show you what uh, things are like down here at Harbor Front as we look about for a moment. Actually, okay, the five-day forecast is coming our way right now. This should explain things very clearly. 8 a.m., beautiful start to Saturday. And then we have these showers, with the thunder showers coming through around noon hour. High 23, still a nice toasty day tomorrow in Toronto, but in between the sunny breaks, heavy, violent weather, and then a shower for most of Saturday. And the showers exist for Sunday, especially early on in the day on Sunday. But you notice it's considerably cooler on Sunday, with a high of about 16. So three quarters of this weekend should be rain-free, but watch out when it hits. Monday and Tuesday, very nice indeed. 
Somewhat cooler than the weather we have been having. Wednesday up to 16 again. 15 is normal for this time of year, and a beautiful mix of cloud and sun is just terrific. That's how things look down here live at the King Queen's Key at the moment. You can see some of the people on that boat actually have sweaters on. The present temperature is 19 at the airport, but not down here. 66 on the Fahrenheit scale. The wind's coming in from the south right now, and that's a pretty strong blow at 22 kilometers per hour. You can look for that to occur tomorrow as well. The barometric pressure at 101.5 is steady right now, and our relative humidity nice and dry at 32 percent, and the sun is shining as you can see. Well, down here at the, the harbor front, it's nice, and I'm afraid this is about the last of the really very nice weather. Tomorrow morning will still be kind of nice, but watch out for a line of severe weather that will come through about noon hour. Sprinkles for the remainder of Saturday, sprinkles on and off on Sunday with some sunny breaks on Sunday. So Sunday looks like the best day of this upcoming weekend. It's cold down here. Back to you in the nice warm studio. <laughs> it is warm in here. Thank you, Brian. All in all, today was perfect for outside activities. And down at Fort York today, hundreds of students from 25 metro schools dressed up as grenadiers to commemorate the famous Battle of York. The Americans captured the town of York on April 27, 1813, and during their five-day occupation, they destroyed all military installations and burned down a number of public buildings. <laughs> Thousands of Toronto school children marked the end of Arbor Week today with tree planting ceremonies in city parks. At 10 o'clock this morning, we found students from 32 schools in High Park celebrating the beauty of trees on the nicest day of the year. Today marks the 20th birthday of Birchmount Park Collegiate in Scarborough. The students had a short school day to make way for the celebrations. Long distance runners carry the official school scroll while 1,000 colorful balloons were set free. And school break dancers performed some of their flashier moves and entertained the folks. <laughs> Happy birthday, Birchmount Park Collegiate. <laughs> Friday night is provincial lottery night. You could be half a million dollars richer and have a wonderful birthday if you have this number. 4-3-1-8-7-3-8. Again, for half a million dollars. Four three one eight seven three eight. Katie, do you ever play lotteries? No, I never ever do, and I always come around to Thursday and and Saturday Think night and should say, I, should. Ah, Could I, I probably would have had those numbers had I <laughs> put my five bucks down, but no, I never do. Okay, what's happening in the world of entertainment, sir? I'll tell you that after 18 years, the National Ballet of Canada is losing one of its most admired principal dancers. Mary Jago, who has danced with the best of them, Nureyev and Barishnikov alike, hung up her points after last night's performance of Giselle at the O'Keeffe Center. In part five of her look at the National Ballet, Jeannie Becker talks with Mary about the prospect of retirement. Mary, why now? Why this particular week, this particular season, are you deciding to quit performing? Because it seemed appropriate. This was a good time for me to stop. I've been thinking about it for, oh, about two years now. I've had itchy feet to do something else. And as I said, my mind has been wandering. There's, there's something else after dance for me. I imagine, though, it must have been an agonizing kind of decision to make at one particular period. No, it isn't an easy decision to make, but it's also, I think, fortunately for me, it was one that was made with peace of mind. Um, I've had a super career. I've really been lucky. I've done everything that anybody could ever wish to do, all the roles. I've had super partners like uh, Mr. Nureyev, um, Anthony Dow. And uh, for me, I reached a pinnacle where I said, Mary, you've had it. You've done it all. Now there's something else. When artistic director Eric Brun heard of Mary's decision to hang up her slippers, he immediately invited her to stay on with the company as a teacher. She accepted. Which aspect of performing do you think you'll miss the most? Well, there's nothing like being out on stage. I think that's it. Just being on stage, I know I'm going to miss it. I mean, you can't help it for all these years. Australian actor Mel Gibson in Toronto shooting Mrs. Soffel ran into a bit of a problem on Wednesday night. At about 8.45 in the evening, he was involved in a minor car accident at Young and College. There were no injuries, but Gibson was charged with impaired driving. The star will appear in court in Toronto on May the 2nd. 
There was a bit of a commotion on Young Street today. Toronto musician Nash the Slash was dressed in his best political haberdashery to shoot a segment for a new music video. I'm an American band by the solo performer will be seen on city television in just a few weeks. And the Diamond Club on Sherburne Street was hopping last night. People from inside the music industry, promoters, radio folks, and record companies gathered to send off Bill Ballard, Pal Hal's son and chairman of Concert Productions International. Ballard is getting married next month, so CPI threw a $5 a head bash to give him a little bit of walking money. And as well as the dancers, the party did attract some artistes. Rush's Getty Lee made it. A quick stop at the watering hole before embarking on a world tour supporting their new LP, Grace Under Pressure. In financial terms, theater in Canada is usually a success if it breaks even, a hit if it makes money. Yesterday, I met a man who has a real hit on his hand. A live children's variety show that in 1984 will be seen by hundreds of thousands of people. Gary Richardson is the man responsible for this hit touring show. This year, the singer-actor will give some 400 performances and gross in the neighborhood of $1 million. But while he is the show's host, he isn't the big star. Pokeroo is the real star of the Polka Dot Door Live, the touring extension of the hit children's television show. In a short two and a half years, it has gone from virtual non-existence to sell-out shows across the country. He's a He's magical because he's a little bit inaccessible and uh, and also a creature the like of which they've never seen. Uh, he, they, they love him, but it's more than that. I, I should I should add to that because he's fun. He's got a great sense of humor. He loves to play tricks, and and kids love to play tricks. Is he healthy for kids? I think so. I love you, Pokeroo. Pokeroo. The TV version of Polka Dot Door has long been a hit, but it's only been through Gary's perseverance that the live presentation has been brought to such a large audience. Mama, shake hands with Pokeroo. You've sang in nightclubs, you've appeared in mainstream movies. Why at this point in your life choose to direct your career towards children? Anytime I've, uh, I've had an opportunity to perform for children, I've had a respect for what I'm doing. And uh, when I was asked to, the, to audition for the Polka Dot Door, I thought this is a, a, a fabulous opportunity and uh, I obviously took it seriously because of my involvement now. Uh, it's, it's been an, an involvement that's grown in leaps and bounds because I wanted it to. Bye everybody. Bye. See you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Boy, those kids have a great time. I emceed an event at Ontario Place past summer with John Candy for crippled children and it was, uh, it was called Reach for the Rainbow and when they came out on the stage, you couldn't hear for yeah. about half an hour. It's nuts, isn't it? The kid yeah, we, that was screaming the loudest was mine. <laughs> we brought the pokeroo out in the beaches there, and all the kids went crazy. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing creation. I'd like to know how they ever came up with the design, but then that's another story. <laughs> Late night and a few of this and that. We're going to stand by for sports with Debbie Van Kikabelt sitting in for the vacationing Jim McKenney and the Gord Martineau. And you were the one who said the Islanders would sweep the series. And you, being the homer you are, were very patriotic yes. to Montreal. Way to go. <laughs> the Canadians and the Oilers were both big winners last night in the second game of Stanley Cup playoff action. The Oilers beat the North Stars 4-3. to three. Gretzky had the winning goal, and although Minnesota disputed the goal, it stood, and the North Stars are now down two games. They're hoping home ice advantage tomorrow night can turn the tide. The Oilers, on the other hand, will be without the services of netminder Grant Fuhrer, who has bruised his elbow. Now in Montreal, the Canadians did it again. They beat the Islanders 4-2 and have an incredible two-game advantage on the Isles. Let's take a look. Score tied one all. Steve Schutt scored to make it 2-1. And then Mondu feeds Matt Nasland, and he scores. The Habs win it 4-2, and that's great. Hope they can keep it up. In Edmonton, the North Stars came out fighting, literally, with the game, but two minutes old, Kevin McClellan took on Greg Levy, and as you can see here, there was some pretty hard hitting. Whoa, that hurt. Linsman had two goals in the first period to give Edmonton a 2-0 lead. In the second, Neil Broughton made it 2-1. 
And the Oilers were ahead 3-2 when Steve Payne with a long pass for Brian Bellows. And that tied the game up at 3-all. And six minutes into the third period, here's the controversial goal by Gretzky. The North Stars say it didn't cross the line, but it did. And Bruce Hood argues that it was a goal. The Oilers won this 4-3. to three. And later on in the game, Grant Fuhr was hit very hard, injured his left arm. He was taken out. Andy Moog came in. He'll start tomorrow night in New York. The Blue Jays are in Kansas City tonight for a three-game stand with the Royals. Doyle Alexander will start. He's still looking for his first decision of the season. On the home front, there was high school baseball today, and our resident heavy hitter, Peter Gross, was there. This game between Eastern Commerce and Lakeview featured some great pitching. Eastern led 2-0, but in the second inning, Lakeview's pitcher, Glenn Ashquab, was throwing heat, striking out Tim Elliott here. Tim Kite then singled off the third baseman's glove. Don Kelsey scored an Eastern lead 3-0. But Ashquab reached back and got out of the inning by fanning Brian Small and Rob Murphy. Eastern had some fine pitching today, too. When John Stathopoulos struck out Mike Kusaris, it was his eighth blowout of the game. His counterpart, Ashquab, was victim number nine. And after a ground out ended the inning, I asked if I could face the all-powerful Stephopoulos. Stephopoulos threw three pitches to me, and I got all of the third, crushing it to deep center. And only the fine advanced scouting of the Eastern Commerce coaching staff and a brisk wind allowed the Saints center fielder to haul it in. Eastern did win this game, by the way, defeating Lakeview. I'm Peter Gross at Stan Wadlow Park for City Pulse. Robert King is the leading jockey at Greenwood, and today he enhanced his position with four more wins. He might have won the ninth had he been riding, but here's what happened anyway. Heading for home, number 11, Rambling Riggs on top, Cabochon was second. Number one, rushing up, was doing just that, rushing up, and he's going for it at the wire. It's Rambling Riggs rushing up, diplomatic ward, 11-1-12 tractor, but it only paid $139.90. And that's it. Well, this is your last sports cast as a single girl. That's right. For those of you who may not be aware, Debbie is getting married on Thursday. And oh. I would like to say that, of course, you will make a gorgeous bride. Your husband-to-be, Robin, I'm sure knows what a lucky man he is. I will see you at your wedding. And, I just want uh, to say you took it very hard when I said no. <laughs> <laughs> so did Reggie. Yeah. yeah. And, Thank uh, you, And on behalf of the thousands of people in the city who watch you every night, congratulations and the best wishes. You're wonderful. All Thank right. You. Have a great weekend, okay. sweetheart. Okay. Street Beat Report next when we come back. City Pulse News Test Answer, Treasurer Larry Grossman will bring down his first budget on May 15th. Tonight's winner can take a friend to dinner at Earl's Tin Palace. It's time to oil up the bicycle. Sunday is Variety Club Bikeathon Day. There are eight routes around Metro. Each begins accepting applicants at eight in the morning. This year's Grand Marshal, the president of the Bikeathon, Bruce Raymond, looking for a big crowd. We certainly won't won't have fewer than fifteen thousand. I'm sure of that. Mm -hmm. Now there there are various times throughout the day when riders can participate in the uh, Bikeathon. Is that right? They can start at eight in the morning and again at another. Well, time. they can start any time they want as long as they start their ride no later than one o'clock. Mm -hmm. They can start as early as eight, and it takes about two hours to do the whole 32-kilometer circuit, Gord. And for those who are not that athletically inclined, there are several different courses, some with hills, some without. That's right. I don't know the city well enough to know exactly which is the best course, but there are eight courses from Mississauga right through to Scarborough, and from the lakefront right up almost up to Markham. So there's lots of latitude for the ones who are more cautious. If by any chance there is an onslaught of rain, but of course we doubt that, don't we? Uh, the bikeathon will be held next Sunday. That's if it does rain, but of course it won't happen. Please get down there and help out all you can. 
Now, the latest from the streets of Toronto as we go live to the fifth floor newsroom and Lauren Honickman. Gord, the little four-year-old boy who fell off the eighth floor balcony at 55 Trillium a short while ago has just been transferred in an emergency run from St. Joseph's Hospital to the hospital for sick children. His condition is still unknown at this time, but we'll keep you posted when the details become available. And the only other thing I have to tell you on Street Beat tonight is that Glenn Cole is back from vacation and he'll be sitting right here on Monday. Back to you. Thank you, Lauren. Entertainment next, J.D. If you're planning on cutting out this weekend, Cindy Lauper is in concert at the okay. Cindy Lauper is in concert at the concert hall tonight. Toronto's Pucka Orchestra opening up on great movies tonight on City. Clint Eastwood stars in a fistful of dollars and at eleven o'clock it's Bruce Lee in Game of Death too. Watch for that one, Gord. Sunday morning we spring the clocks ahead one hour. But if Michael Cassidy had his way, daylight saving time would be in early March. He'll be in the studio to talk about it on City Pulse tonight at ten. Live weather from Queen Street. Here's Brian. You can see by the way these boats are heeling over. It is windy out. Bundle up if you're heading out tonight. Watch out for a severe line of thunderstorms going through about Saturday noon and then showers off and on for the rest of the weekend. Deb. City TV is playing Oakwood in volleyball tonight. Peter Gross will have those highlights for you as well as Kansas City Royals and the Toronto Blue Jays. Dini. We'll see you next me week. Next week? Me next week. I'll be old beard head. <laughs> <laughs> I'll up and mashed. You'll know what happened to me. You should be Mrs. Ross. You should go out and ride your bicycle on Sunday. Whatever you do, have a good weekend. Go ahead. That's City Pulse for now. I'll be back at 10 with City Pulse tonight. Now, if you spend most of today indoors, you miss what we've been waiting for all winter. A beautiful day in a beautiful city where the streets are filled with music. Have a good weekend. Night. Thank <laughs> you.